Hi. I'm Dr. Arthur Chesterfield Evans. See this billboard? It's been changed a bit. Funnily enough, these sort of changes seem to happen particularly to billboards for alcohol and cigarettes. I'm one of the people responsible for these sort of changes. I'm just a minor graffitist, but I'm one of five doctors and a university professor who've been arrested for it. Now, you don't normally think of a doctor as somebody who gets uh, hauled off to the cop shop for maliciously injuring private property, do you? This is quite a nostalgic piece for me. This is not unlike the day in which I first got arrested. But let me tell you how I first got involved in this sort of seemingly antisocial behaviour. When I was a young medico, just fresh out of med school, I thought I was going to save the human race. I was going to find cures for cancer and eliminate disease. I was an idealist. But when you start out as a doctor, you spend a lot of time doing rounds and in casually fixing up drunks with broken arms and legs. But I went on a step further, and I spent a lot of time assisting in operations. You know the sort of thing, ripping out diseased lungs, cutting out cancerous tongues, sawing off gangrenous feet and legs, generally slaving over a hot ventilator. All of these conditions are directly related to smoking and tobacco. And quite frankly, I thought it was a pity that good people had to lose their various bodily parts. Have you ever seen a cancerous lung? This is quite a good example. It doesn't have a name, but we'll call it the best part of Vincent C. Vincent C was my first lung cancer patient. I'd like to dedicate this film to Vincent. As a young man, Vincent did the sort of things that other young men do. He used to go to parties, to the races, and out for a drink with his mates. He wasn't a wild sort of guy. Quiet, really, with a dry sense of humour. He eventually met Shirley. They fell in love and got married. He had a good job, and before too long, he and Shirley had their first daughter, then another, then another. It was a good life, except for one thing. You see, from the time he was 14, Vincent was addicted to tobacco. In fact, he smoked at least a pack of cigarettes a day. Anyhow, for most of his life, he felt fine. He just kept cranking out his dry humour at the office as he sucked those smokes right down into his body. I guess about 10 litres of thick, black, tarry stuff would have passed through his lungs. This is a model of a healthy body, an incredibly beautiful machine. So well designed that normally it fixes itself. Obviously, Vincent's body was male, but it started off as healthy as this, and it could handle just about anything. But after 25 years of smoking, poor old Vincent's immune system couldn't cope. He developed lung cancer and he packed it in. In fact, 90% of people who develop cancer of the lung do so from smoking. Amazing, isn't it? You wouldn't think the percentage would be that high. But removing cancerous lungs was only part of the job. There are other wondrous aspects to being a trainee doctor and other sorts of cancer as well. Meet Mrs. Johnson. How are you, Mrs. Johnson? <laughs> Why are you still smoking? <laughs> you like it. What brand are you smoking now? <laughs> Can you show the camera? <laughs> I'm sorry if you can't understand, Mrs. Johnson, but at 45 years, after 30 years of smoking, she developed cancer of the mouth. She needed a radical neck dissection with radiation treatment, removal of part of her jaw and all of her tongue. So she has trouble talking, eating and drinking. She tends to dribble a bit. Sometimes she uses two boxes of tissues a day. It's not very pleasant. Perhaps we shouldn't have showed you this. It's not in good taste. But hooking people on cigarettes, that's in good taste. That's OK. They might even give you a knighthood for it. Thanks very much, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> you ever seen something like this before? Kind of reminds you what you might use to lop the branch off a tree. But this is no ordinary saw. This is the type of saw 
I used to lop off gangrenous legs and toes of people whose circulation was affected by smoking. You don't hear much about it, but actually it's quite common. And 70% of this type of amputation is caused by smoking. And the classic case is the fellow who you lop off one leg, still addicted to smoking, so two years later, you lop off the other one. That's the way it is. People think nicotine addiction is mainly psychological, but cigarettes are actually more addictive than heroin. Your nervous system readjusts to the nicotine, and if you don't have it, you feel stressed. Your nerves scream out. In fact, most of the so-called pleasure of smoking is actually getting rid of the withdrawal syndrome of the addictive drug. <laughs> Tobacco, in fact, is so bad for you that you don't even have to smoke to die from it. You just have to be around people who are doing it. It's called involuntary or passive smoking. The tobacco people will tell you it's not too bad for you. Did you know tobacco smoke contains more than 2,000 harmful chemicals? But the tobacco will tell you it's no problem. You probably don't mind that your eyes sting and your throat hurts from the formaldehyde given off by the tobacco. That's just part of a night out. But formaldehyde's a carcinogen. It's also used to pickle dead bodies. And nicotine is in the air as well. It's a poison used in insecticides. If injected, the nicotine from one pack of cigarettes is enough to kill you. And, oh yeah, then there's the carbon monoxide. You know, like the exhaust fumes of a car. You usually don't like breathing it in, unless you want to kill yourself. Anyway, I was telling you how I came to be arrested as a vandal. There I was, cutting out bits of people and cutting off bits of people, and I started to get angry. I thought, why are these people dying? Why are they still smoking? I looked around me at the 45-year-old who couldn't make it up a flight of steps without stopping to catch his breath. At the 40-year-old who had to stop because of the bad circulation in her legs at the 35-year-old who looked to be in his 40s because of the prematurely wrinkled skin around his eyes. I soon realised that a lot of the illness that I was treating was lifestyle illness and could easily have been prevented. I thought that I'd like to get to the other end of the assembly line. Not where they wheel them in for surgery, but where they first started to do the things that would eventually bring them there. So I decided to get into preventative medicine. I began by talking to people and telling them the facts. Just to sell more. But here's another guy. If someone's an addict, they won't, they won't care if they're advertising yeah, a product or not. They're an addict already. But addicts were not impressed. So I thought, aha, uh -huh, a slideshow. That'll do it. I'm not really like my ass, man. If it didn't. And that's the problem with lifestyle illnesses. Though they're the greatest killers in the Western world, people just don't believe in them because they can't see them until it's too late. But lifestyle illness is not a bolt from the blue. It's when the last straw breaks the camel's back. Smoking must be the ultimate lifestyle illness. Why would people start smoking? When they, particularly when it's unpleasant at first, and they know that it can kill them. I mean, part of the answer might be that their parents smoke, or some of their friends smoke. Then the answer hit me. The answer was all around me. It was advertising that was keeping society smoking, making smoking seem acceptable. Advertising with its sophisticated imagery of beautiful places, beautiful people were spinning us stories. Bought and paid for by huge corporations, advertising was countering all that's been uncovered by medical research. So that was it. 
multinational tobacco companies were making hundreds of billions of dollars selling a product that was going to kill people. And they were spending three and a half billion dollars a year promoting it. That is horrible. Of all the potentially dangerous products on the market, like alcohol and tranquilizers, tobacco is the worst. Eighty to ninety percent of lung cancer is caused by smoking. Twenty-five percent of all heart disease is tobacco related. Nicotine is twice as poisonous as arsenic and three times as poisonous as cyanide. One out of every four people who smoke die from it. Tobacco kills more people in the Western world than alcohol, all other drugs and automobiles combined. About 50 people a day in Australia. But that's just reality. That's not the image. The advertising image is of a million beautiful things. They keep on linking smoking to beauty. Subtle variations on total bullshit. But the tobacco industry doesn't care. The tobacco industry is happy to lie. Let's face it, the tobacco industry is full of bad guys. Let's look at some ads for Alpine. See how they work. This beautiful couple are dunking their deck chairs in the sparkling clean water of an expensive resort. So who's smoking? She is. Alpine's the young woman's cigarette. Her smoking hand reaches out to initiate first contact with her man. She's confident. She's what every young girl would like to be. She's got it all. And it looks like she might get even more. Yep. Swept off her deck chair. The smoke on her breath has sent him into an absolute frenzy. So not only will smoking Alpine make you a rich and beautiful person in a sparkling clean world. Well, pictures speak louder than words. Of course, in reality, he'd be short of breath, she'd have yellow teeth, and they'd both have prematurely wrinkled skin. Sophisticated lies, aren't they? And they work, but they're also evil. So much of the advertising is aimed at children, trying to con them to get at their money. And that's an interesting point. In Australia, with regards to tobacco, the advertising industry is supposed to be self-regulatory. Under a voluntary code, it's supposed to prohibit advertising aimed at children. But the spirit of this code is clearly being abused. The tobacco companies take the line that they don't advertise in order to get people to take up smoking, just to get them to change brands. So I guess that means that cigarette ads are invisible to people under 16 and that beautiful girls and handsome guys with flash cars not of interest to young teenagers. They don't want that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is, if the tobacco companies don't hook children, their profits are just going to dry up. And the ads are definitely getting to them. A survey of Sydney teenagers found that they smoked the most advertised brands out of proportion to the rest of the population. And most children themselves believe that advertising probably encourages them to take up smoking. So even though there are regulations that are supposed to stop ads targeting children, the ad companies find a way around them. And governments are not doing enough to enforce the code. Let's take an example. Regulation 2.3 of the Cigarette Advertisers Code of Ethics states that an ad should not show cigarettes being handled in a family situation. Now, what's the most famous family you can think of? The royal family? Here they are in full colour on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. Now, for cigarette advertisers who want maximum value for their advertising dollar, only the best will do. But Charles and I aren't really models in a cigarette ad, are they? The ad's just the bit at the bottom. The tobacco companies are full of such subtle legal distinctions. They use sports sponsorship to get to the young through their sporting heroes. They plaster racing cars with their logos. You can buy them at your local toy store. And at the Royal Easter Show, the premier children's event of the year in Sydney, tobacco ads are everywhere.
let's not forget the movies. When young people first go out with their peers and no olds, it's exciting. You can do anything you want to do, be anything you want to be. You're growing up. But how do you prove it? Tobacco companies have the answer, and the ads are right there on the silver screen. And you can afford the money. No matter which social group you're in, the tobacco companies have a brand of cigarette that is tailor-made to suck you in, to make you feel that you're not part of the gang unless you're smoking that brand. So when you put your money into a vending machine to buy a packet of fags, you might think that it's pretty cool, that you're now part of the gang. But making you cool isn't what the tobacco companies want. All that they're interested in is this, where you put your money. They just want to get rich. They don't care if you die, just as long as they get the money. Someone had to do something. A group called Bugger Up was formed, and I joined it. What it decided to do was to use satire as a way of beating the tobacco companies at their own game. We became sort of Robin Hoods, out there at midnight with our trusty spray cans, taking a few risks to stop the bad guys. People liked us for this, and generally we were not dogged in. But sometimes things did go wrong, and that's how I came to get arrested. But even then, it wasn't all bad. The courts didn't treat us too harshly. They often seem to understand. One judge even said in his summing up that he had the utmost sympathy for anyone who was doing what they could to remedy the situation. And Bugger Up hasn't confined itself to billboards. If the tobacco companies are doing it, it's got to be bad. Take the time that Philip Morris was running a competition to find the Marlboro Man. We produced our own candidate, a man who, because he had smoked, now had to breathe through a hole in his throat. So I don't know if you're impressed with our Marlboro man, but the tobacco company certainly wasn't. And by raising the profile of smoking as an issue, we and the rest of the health lobby throughout the world have already had quite a lot of success. In many situations, smoking is no longer considered socially acceptable. Tobacco ads have been banned on television, and smoking is no longer permitted on many trains, aircraft, and in public places. But our successes are not enough. Worldwide, millions of people still die every year. And advertisers still target the world's most important resource, our young. We can't allow the multinational tobacco companies to continue to make profits out of ill health and death. We must pressure governments to ban all forms of tobacco promotion. So if you don't yet smoke, don't be conned. If you smoke already, quit. And whoever you are, do whatever you can to help stamp out smoking. That's what a lung looks like. That's what I'm being pulled out of people. That's what it's like dying. That's the stock and trade the doctors see all the time. And these smooth PR people and the now, look, uh, I'm a fellow with a heart of gold with the ways of a gentleman, I've been told. I'm the kind of a guy that wouldn't even hurt a flea. Yeah, but if me and a certain character mad guy that invented this here cigarette, I'm going to murder that son of a gun in the first degree. You've got to smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. Puff it and puff it. Puff self to death. Tell St. Peter at the Golden Gate, hey, man, I don't want to make you wait, but I've got to have that other cigarette. You've got to smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. That cigarette. Puff it and puff it. Puff self to death. Tell St. Peter at the Golden Gate, hey, man, I don't want to make you wait, but I've got to have that other cigarette. 
smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. That cigarette. Pop it, pop it. Pop <laughs> yourself that kettle. St. Peter at the Golden Gate. Hey man, I don't want to make you wait, but I have got to have that other cigarette. Got to have that other bag. Got to have that other. 